Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Tropospheric Ducting. In this presentation, we'll provide a brief technical introduction to tropospheric ducting and explain how tropospheric ducting can enable long-distance propagation at VHF and higher frequencies. Let's start with an overview of the troposphere, which is the lowest layer of the Earth's atmosphere. It extends from the Earth's surface to an altitude of approximately 10 to 15 kilometers, and is where most weather occurs. Unlike the ionosphere, which is strongly affected by UV radiation from the sun, the troposphere is not ionized by solar radiation, and therefore the troposphere does not play a significant role in HF propagation. However, UV radiation from the sun does create heating in the troposphere and thus affects weather patterns. As we'll see in this presentation, weather can sometimes play a significant role in the propagation of signals at VHF and even higher frequencies. Refraction is the underlying principle for most tropospheric propagation at VHF. Refraction causes signals to bend in the direction of higher refractivity and thus can extend the radio horizon beyond the geometric horizon. The higher refractivity at lower altitudes means that normal atmospheric behavior is to refract VHF signals back towards the ground. The amount of bending in the troposphere is quantified in terms of the refractive index, N. This is normally frequency independent at VHF and is a function of three atmospheric factors, pressure, temperature, and humidity or water vapor content. As mentioned a moment ago, the refractive index of the troposphere normally decreases with altitude. This is because atmospheric pressure decreases steadily as altitude increases, and air temperature also normally decreases with altitude. That is, higher air layers are colder than lower air layers. However, some weather patterns can cause warmer air to be present over colder air, and this is referred to as a temperature inversion. These inversions can cause large and abrupt changes in the troposphere's refractive index and these abrupt changes can lead to the formation of something called a tropospheric duct. Tropospheric ducting occurs when signals are refracted back and forth between two boundaries in a way similar to how signals travel through a waveguide. Signals that are propagated via ducting are often very strong. Ducts are essentially two-dimensional, so signal strength decreases more or less linearly with distance. Contrast this to propagation in three dimensions, in which power decreases by the square of the distance. Ducts are capable of carrying VHF and higher frequency signals for very long distances, up to 1500 kilometers or more in some cases. Ducts also tend to build up and fade away gradually, but once formed, ducts typically persist for at least a couple of hours and may last up to several days. Tropospheric ducting can propagate signals with frequencies from the lower VHF range up to UHF and higher. Similar to the way a waveguide works, the width of the inversion, or duct, determines the frequencies that can be propagated through the duct. The thinner the inversion layer, or duct, the higher the frequency of signals that it can propagate. It's not uncommon for ducts to become thicker over time, and this increased thickness then allows propagation of lower frequency signals. In other words, a newly formed duct may begin propagating only higher frequency signals and then later begin propagating lower frequency signals. Geography plays an important role in the formation of ducts. Ducts are more often found in warmer areas and near bodies of water, particularly in coastal regions. Temperature inversions are more common in these areas, in part because the ground along coasts tends to cool more quickly than the upper air. Time of the year is also very important. In the United States, July and August have the highest number of ducts, but ducting can also take place year-round. In fact, tropospheric ducting can often be predicted or forecasted using standard meteorological or weather information. For example, if a region of warm air intersects a region of cooler air and slides above it, this can create a temperature inversion and ducting. Note, however, that a stable air mass is needed for creation of temperature inversions and ducts. If the atmosphere becomes unsettled or well-mixed, such as following a storm, 
then formation of ducts becomes much less likely. And finally, note that ducts will move with the weather. In North America, this movement is primarily west to east. Depending on how they're formed, ducts can be classified as either surface ducts or elevated ducts. These have somewhat different propagation characteristics, so let's take a few moments to look more closely at these two different types. Surface ducts are created by a single discontinuity in the troposphere's refractive index. This discontinuity forms the top boundary of the duct, and the Earth's surface forms the lower boundary. Generally speaking, surface ducts do not carry signals very well over land. The land surface of the Earth is lossy and irregular, and both natural and man-made obstacles will scatter and absorb signals. Surface ducts do, however, propagate signals well over large, calm bodies of water, and these types of surface ducts are often responsible for very long-distance tropospheric propagation. Elevated ducts, on the other hand, are created by two discontinuities in the troposphere. The upper discontinuity refracts signals downwards, and the lower discontinuity refracts signals upwards, so signals are propagated between these two discontinuities. Elevated ducts typically form at altitudes of a few hundred meters to a few kilometers. Since this is above many surface features, elevated ducts normally are able to propagate signals for longer distances over land compared to a surface duct. Regardless of the type of duct, the best propagation conditions are observed between stations at or near opposite ends of the ducts. In some cases, stations that are along the path of an elevated duct may not be able to launch signals into or receive signals from the duct. Some ducts are, however, leaky and will allow signals to enter or exit the duct at various points along the path. Before we conclude this presentation, it would be a good idea to compare tropospheric ducting with something called sporadic E. Patches of increased ionization in the E layer of the ionosphere can reflect VHF signals back to Earth, and this is referred to as sporadic E. Like tropospheric ducting, sporadic E can produce strong signals over large geographic distances, but these two propagation modes can be differentiated in a number of ways. As we've seen, ducts tend to propagate signals only between the ends of the ducts, or occasionally from points along the path between them. Sporadic E clouds, however, can connect a large number of different locations. Ducts also build up and fade out slowly, whereas sporadic E appears and disappears rather suddenly. And while sporadic E only lasts for a short period of time, that is, minutes, ducts often last for several hours or more. Let's end with a brief summary. The normal behavior of the troposphere is to refract VHF signals towards the Earth's surface. This is because bending occurs in the direction of higher refractive indices, which are usually found at lower altitudes. Phenomena such as temperature inversions can, however, create sharp changes in the troposphere's refractive index, and this in turn leads to the creation of so-called tropospheric ducts. These ducts behave in a similar way to a waveguide and can propagate VHF and higher frequency signals over long distances with relatively little path loss. Depending on where the inversions occur, Ducts may be classified as either surface ducts or as elevated ducts. And finally, duct-based propagation is usually best between stations at opposite ends of the duct, although in some cases a leaky duct may propagate signals from stations located between these endpoints. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Tropospheric Ducting. If you'd like to learn more about other propagation modes, or about Rodian Schwartz solutions for radio communications, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.